Namaskar to all of you. We have very limited time, General Dwedi, so uh, I'll start uh, with the question straight away. Uh, good morning to you, and how are you today? Thank you. As far as the time is concerned, I am sure the next uh, session under Vice Chief will be considerate enough to give us more time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so time will not be at uh, shortage. Fantastic. You took charge three months back, and um, it's been um, a period of churn for the neighborhood. Would you say that China is still the biggest security challenge for India, and how do you assess the situation at the border given the high levels of troop deployment and the tensions, and at the same time, statements from the Chinese side saying there is progress and, uh, and more convergence and fewer differences? So though I have taken three months, but uh, it has 40 years of experience behind it. Of course. So uh, as far as China is concerned, it has been intriguing our mind for quite some time. And I keep saying with China, you have to compete, you have to cooperate, you have to coexist, you have to confront and contest. So what's the situation today as we are looking at? The positive signaling is coming from the diplomatic side. But what we have to understand, the diplomatic side gives you the options and possibilities. But when it comes to the execution on ground, when it relates to the ground per se, it is dependent on the military commanders on both the sides to take those decisions. So what's the situation today? It's stable, but it's not normal, and it's sensitive. So if that be the case, what are we wanting? We are wanting that the situation, what was there pre-April 2020, that should be restored back, whether in terms of the ground uh, occupation situation or the buffer zones which have been created or patrolling which have been kind of a planned as of now. So till the time that situation is not restored, as far as we are concerned, situation will remain sensitive and we are fully operationally prepared to face any kind of a contingency which will come through. And in complete gamut, if you see, the trust has become the biggest casualty. So do you see progress? Because that is the word that is being uh, you know, used a lot, that there is progress. Uh, do you see a possible deal on, say, uh, on Demchok or, or some other place? So what we're talking about from April 20, we see that over a period of time, both sides have been sitting together. Diplomatic parlays have been taking place. We have had approximately uh, 17 uh, SHMCL or the core commanders level conference. We had 21 WMCC conferences which have taken place. And we have come a long way in the sense whatever were the low-hanging fruit, those have been already been resolved. Now, when it comes to the difficult situations where we have a different perception from both the sides, it means that both sides need to have in any negotiation win-win situation. So some kind of indication have been given from both the diplomatic side. Now the military side will sit together and see how this can be translated on ground. And when it comes, what is on the table? Everything which is we can think of, it's on the table along the northern front, and it also includes Depsang and Demchok. China has also been building a lot of infrastructure, including the so-called model villages along the border, um, in an attempt to assert its, uh, its claims, uh, territorial claims. And India has uh, of late also started building such villages, mostly in Arunachal Pradesh. Does it help in, in countering Chinese expansionism? So let me take firstly why China is uh, constructing those villages. Is the China population close or the Tibet population close to the line of actual control? I find most of the places the answer is no. So what they are doing, they are carrying out this artificial immigration, artificial settlement which are being carried out. No problem, it's their country, they can do whatever they want. But what we see in South China, see what's happening. That when we are talking about the grey zone, initially we find fishermen, and those kind of the people who are in the forefront. And in order to save them, then you find the military moving in. So is it leading to a, some kind of a gray zone where the causation may look very simple, but it may have a grandiose design behind it. That's what we need to look into. As far as Indian Army is concerned, we've already been having this kind of a model villages, etc., which we have been carrying out this job. We have of Sadbhavna, of Samaritan, we have been having these kind of resources. But what is more important, that the state governments have been empowered now to kind of put in those resources. And this is the time where the army, the state governments, and supervision by the central government, all three are coming together. So the model villages which are coming up now will be much more better. And here I will quote our prime minister on 1st April 2023, 
when we talked about the vibrant village programs, he spoke to all the commander in chiefs. He said, what I am looking from the army is basically to provide the soul to these villages. What it means, if you translate that cultural revival, the trust among the local population that the whole of India is supporting them. They are not the last village, they are the first village. The reverse immigration which must take place. The tourism must come up and they should feel important wherever they are staying. Let's also talk about Jammu and Kashmir. They're having an election as we speak. Um, and uh, we've seen the security situation evolve over the past five years uh, since the scrapping of Article 370. Uh, how do you describe things at the moment? And we've also seen that in the past, uh, terror attacks were concentrated in Kashmir, but now there's a new wave of attacks in Jammu. What explains this, this shift? So before I come to present situation, I must quote August 2019, what happened, you, well, you all are well aware. And thereafter went as an army commander, and Devin Pandey is sitting here, who was the core commander, and uh, we met uh, one of the ladies a wife of one of the active politicians. And she said, after this abrogation of Article 370, at least my children know when the principal tells that please draw the flag of the country when you come back tomorrow, during the Independence Day, as you are aware, the two countries have Independence Day one day after the other. Now they are very clear that which country flag to be drawn. Means the clarity which was there has only emerged after August 2019 that what JNK means to India and what India means to JNK. With that, if I have to talk today, what are the indicators what we see? What's the situation? Has it improved? Let's take calculation. Amarnath Yatra, in the last 10 years, this has crossed the magic figure of 5 lakhs. 2023, more than 2 crores tourists have reached this area. The development is phenomenal. So if you take all the parameters which are there, let's take on the terrorism side, only two recruits, and that also in 2024, only two people have been recruited, where the figures used to be 100, 200, 300 earlier. If you see all these parameters, I feel we are moving towards peace and, peace and prosperity. Now, when you have some kind of a sand put on ground and you put the water, where does the water flow? Water flows to those places where you will find there is no obstacle. So what we had done, we had concentrated on southern Kashmir most of the time. We had concentrated in some areas of Punch and if I can say that uh, Jammu. So the areas which were left, if I will not say totally unaddressed, but what was there, we were looking for most peace and prosperity because those people, places we could invest money. The development was forthcoming. Now those areas have been addressed now by the adversary, the country which is on the western border, and the terrorists which have come now are basically most of them foreign terrorists who have come, and they are going into these areas. Similarly, northern Kashmir also, these people are going into these areas. So what happened? We reoriented, re-energized, and refocused our forces which are there, security forces. But that's not important. What is more important, the police has gone in for a major revamp because our state will only stabilize if its police is effective. And that's for you, what we are trying to empower. You also visited Manipur last month, uh, and Manipur has been gripped by ethnic violence for more than a year now, and it doesn't help them that they have uh, a border that they share with Myanmar, which is dealing with its own problems, and uh, there are concerns about a spillover. What is your assessment of the ground situation there? In the lighter vein, ek ke saath ek free because Manipur was a problem and now you have the Myanmar problem also coming in. So as far as Manipur problem of you see in May 2023, it all started with a rumor that there was a Anglo cookie war centenary gate which is being burnt. It was not being burnt. I have gone on ground and confirmed from everyone. Now that rumor mongering led to major violence which is still finding its kind of a stabilization phase which has not reached. So what has happened over a period of time? It has become a battle of narratives. There's a polarization between the communities. The situation may be sta stable today, but it is tensed. Now, what all can be done about it? But before that, what all other things which have happened? What you talked about, internally displaced people, the number reached to 60,000. Of course, with our perseverance now, that has come to below 40,000. Similarly, this society has weaponized, got weaponized to some extent. Why? 
because the weapons were looted. That also needs to be seen. The women-led organizations have come up for the defensive purposes. The underground organizations have come up for the defensive purposes. The battle lines are getting hardened. Therefore, what we have done as of now, that firstly we have to be very clear, it has to be whole of nation approach. As far as the Army and Assam Rifle is concerned, we have deployed approximately 126 columns of Army and Assam Rifle combined together in conjunction with so many other stakeholders which are already operating in this state. And we are trying to calm down the situation. We are trying to bring in the trust. We are trying to restore the trust. It will take its own time. Because when the social cracks or the social fracturing takes place, it takes own time to kind of recover. But what has also happened that we've been able to recover a large number of weapons. Approximately, if I can say that, 25% of weapons have already been recovered. And double the weapon which are of local kind, that also been recovered. I've also gone and met the ex-servicemen because they are the last bastion of national integration and social harmony. They are advising us how to go about it. We are working closely with them as well as the central administration to look into how, what are the possible lines of effort which we should go ahead in future. Are there concerns about foreign assistance to certain militant groups from Myanmar? If we retrace the history of Manipur, the issues are very, very complicated. We have to go back to the Kabao Valley and so on and so forth. We will not talk about it. But what is important, we earlier had something called as Valley-based Insurgent Groups, VBIGs. From where, where were they being supported? They were being supported from across. Now, similar kind of allegations is coming for the other groups. Out here, what we are looking at, that we should not allow wrong narratives to be built up. For example, there was a narrative of the bomb drones. We have come, gone on ground and checked up. There is no bomb drone. There was another wrong narrative which we said 900 anti-national elements have infiltrated. We checked up. There is nothing like that. So if we control that, I think things will be all right. Now what we are talking about, the external support. As far as the external support is concerned, Myanmar is having its own problem. When we are having their own problem, what happens? They also have some people who are getting displaced. When they are getting displaced, where will they go? They will only go to those places which are peaceful and ready to accept them. And that's what is happening in Mizoram and Manipur. So those people who are coming, they are coming unarmed and they are coming for kind of a, some kind of a shelter. Mm -hmm. And India, the country we are, we will make sure that they provide the shelter, food and support till the time we can. Globally, we are seeing geopolitical alliances shifting and uh, there are changing equations as well. And increasingly, it appears that the best strategy in a scenario like this is to be self-reliant, Atmanirbharta. Uh, the world is, uh, you know, accepting this as, as a winning strategy. India has been at it for a while, including self-reliance and defense, making India in defense. How do you see the progress on that front, on, uh, on defense development, production, technological innovation? Are we meeting our goals? So before that, we see why Atmanirbharta has become important. In the recent wars, what we have seen, that these wars are going to be long duration. Mass fire, mass application. And innovative ideas and on-ground adaptation. If you three all see all these three things, you will find that arms and ammunition has to be your own. Platforms have to be your own. Then only you can have the capability to provide the search. That is the only time when you can modify a platform. And you can only fight with your own arms because you know that the sustenance is possible. And over a period of time, what we have seen that when you get it from the other places, the modification to platforms and other things are not possible because the IPR is not there with you, the technology is not there with you, the sustenance spare parts are not there with you. Now, coming on to the Indian Army, as far as the Indian Army is concerned, has taken a pledge that more than 85% of whatever acquisition we are carrying out will be of Indian origin. That is point number one. Our theme is Swadeshi Karan says Sashakti Karan. If that is the theme, even in the positive indigenization list what we are talking about, 35% that is out of the 509 item of 176 have been sponsored by Indian Army. The schemes of IDEX Aditi, we are doing a great job in that also. Then make one and make two which has been uh, now included in DAP 2020. This is basically to facilitate that the Indian industries get kind of motivated and they invest money. 
And here also we have been able to pitch in a lot of money. It comes to approximately 1.13 lakh crores is the money what we have invested. Then we also see as the PSUs are concerned, they have got corporatized. Now what does it mean? That till the time they do not become Atmanipa within themselves, we need to carry out hand holding. And that's what we are doing. While ensuring that as the private industry is concerned, we should be able to provide them the healthy ecosystem and give them the commitment and assurance that we are there for you. Now this is as far as their actions are concerned. Now certain more things what we are doing is, the defense acquisition procedure which is there was made long back. And it was basically to look at whether the import items which are there, we are being fair and transparent in their acquisition or not. But now when we are talking about Atmanir Bharta, I think we need to be more frank and open about it. So what we are doing, we have gone in for the emergency procurement, we are aware, EP4 which is there, 100% it has been indigenized procurement. We are also looking at accelerated procurement program and this is uh, my Deputy Chief CDNS is sitting here, he is working on that and the best part is the Defence Secretary in the complete setup in the Ministry of Defence is also in agreement that we need to look into it. So we are working towards that also. Third thing is technology, it is moving so fast that if you wait for a year, you will get only your children mobile. You will not be able to get a new mobile. So if that be the case, means or what we earlier used to say, Moore's law, we need to move fast. And therefore, the standard acquisition procedure and technology acquisition need to decouple. And we're working towards that. Let's also talk about the war in West Asia, which is clearly expanding. I was coming this morning and I got a news flash that they've, they've begun a ground offensive in Lebanon. The Israelis have become. Where, where, where do you think this is heading? And uh, my second question in the same, on the same subject is that we've seen some disturbing precedents being set in this conflict, including the use of uh, everyday gadgets and, uh, you know, turning pagers and walkie talkies into bombs. And it makes people think everywhere in the world that we are all carrying some gadget or the other at all points and we are all sitting ducks. So do you, d does India share this concern about these methods and what are we doing to ensure that we are not um, at the receiving end of something like this? So let me take your point number one, which you said that uh, the ground offensive is uh, ready to start. Israeli saying is, mow the grass. So that for some time, thereafter, at least there is rest. It will come up again, we will take care of it. And that's what they have been doing. But this time, they have done something different. And if you read the India Way, uh, the book written by our external affairs minister, he talks about if you have got two sides, which side will you handle first? You have to take sides. And he talked about something that Abhimanyu was not to required to go for Chakravyu. It was basically, it was meant for Yudhishthir or Arjuna, so that they could have taken on that. But that is the time Arjuna was challenged by somebody else and he went there. Had he decided to go into the Chakra view, he would have come out alive and Avmanyu would have got saved. Similarly, in this case, Israel has decided very clearly that Hamas is primary uh, focus which I must maintain. So what is done? He is completely firstly wiped out the Hamas opposition. Thereafter, he said, okay, let me see on the other side. And if you see the page of what you're talking about, it's a Taiwan company being uh, supplied to Hungarian company, Hungarian company thereafter giving it to them. The shell company which has been created is something which is a master stroke by Israelis. And for that, it requires years and years of preparation. So it means they were prepared for it. And that is what it counts, that the war does not start the way you start fighting. It starts the day you start planning. And this is what is most important. So they had planned all these activities and what they did, firstly they made sure that the pages get blasted off, people get injured, people die. Okay. Now what happens, perforce now you have to shift to mobile. Moment you shift to mobile, what happens, your signals are getting triangulated. They also went away ahead, they went for the sonic boom. What they did, they flew the aircraft in a manner that the sonic boom makes a sound in different timings. Once it makes a different timings and Nasrullah was creating a live relay. When he was creating a live relay, they carried out a triangulation methodology to focus which building is he staying. Now that kind of a something which is never heard of earlier. This is the first time we are hearing this kind of a thing. Coming on to the our side, yes, the same threat rights. So supply, chain, interruption, interception is something we have to be very watchful. So we have to have various levels of inspection on all these issues 
whether it is the uh, technological level as well as manual level also to make sure such things do not get repeated in our case. Uh, we've been talking about Vis Viksit Bharat for 2047. The government has set uh, uh, very ambitious goals and uh, I understand security is going to be a key part of it. What is India's strategic vision for 2047 on defense and security? Uh, Ms. Palki, firstly, when we talk about prosperous nation at the rate of 2047, I think two prefixes are very important, progressive and peaceful. And moment you add this, the net security provided happens to be the Indian Army. When I'm saying all the three services all together, we become very important. So therefore, when we talk about the national security strategy or we talk about the dime, I think T has suddenly got added on itself because that has become very important in what we saw recently. So first of all, as for the national security apparatus is concerned, there we play a very important role because as a security assurer, we need to have the capability of war fighting on both the fronts. And if we have the war fighting capability, then only it means that we'll act as a deterrence. As for the internal security is concerned, you are aware that what's happening on the western side, on the eastern side, and we are adequately poised to take care of that. Also in terms of HADR and other things, we are doing our job. Now what more is emerging is the gray zone. And after Doklam, what has happened, we realize that there is something gray zone which is existing. From self-denial, we move to now self-realization. Now is the time we have to work more on this because it's not only the land. It is the so many domains which are working in that that we need to take care of. So we need to harmonize in the gray zone also. Now this is as far as the national security apparatus is concerned. Atmanir Bharta we have already discussed. I would not like to cover that. Then we also need to look into defense diplomacy. Now defense diplomacy, we can play a very, very important role. Soft power we are the way we are. Defense exports we can encourage in a big way. Then best practices of the host country. We exchange our training team. We exchange our training um, uh, teams and... Uh, uh, other exercises what we are carrying out and we find that a lot of experience can be gained from each side. Also, there are a lot many battle narrative, the military narratives which are required to be synergized in terms of uh, so many, uh, if I can say the regulations and resolutions which are passed in the UN where we need to sit together. UN peacekeeping force. Now I'll give you the example of resolution number 1235 which talks about women empowerment. Now, that is something we have recently uh, signed off, uh, had a great discussion with Japan. We are having with other countries also. And uh, we are one of those countries where five female engagement teams have been deployed. So this is as far as the diplomacy is concerned. Now, as far as the nation building is concerned, I think uh, there is no end to the list which I can uh, start on and on. Environment conservation, women empowerment, infrastructure development, and uh, sports. Uh, national integration. So there are a lot many things which we are doing in nation building. I'll just to give it a small kind of a summing up point on this issue is when I carried out a discussion on Ladakh itself, we realized the army brings on the platter more money than the tourists bring on the platter for Ladakh. So wherever we are deployed, the local economy gets a big boost. If the JNK today is sustaining itself on its own, the military plays a very, very pivotal role in that. Theatrization is uh, uh, being called a key part of the 2047 roadmap, and there are concerns around it. Uh, some experts say that the army will have, uh, have more control because of the sheer size and presence. How do you address those concerns? And do you think India is ready for something like this? Yeah, I can see more greens here, but I don't think the control will be with them. Yeah, I find others also here. So... Uh, as far as uh, theatrization is concerned, uh, I don't know how much I can speak in open, but just to tell you, as far as uh, this issue is concerned, General Rawat, our first CDS, uh, laid a great foundation for that. And when General Anil Chauhan took over, he made sure that we will only go to the media or we'll tell others once we have been able to achieve a consensus. And we went in a big way. We had uh, all commander in chiefs conferences. We discussed a lot of issues, sorted out a lot of issues. And today we have a great consensus among the three chiefs and the CDS that we have been able to uh, devise a complete structure, planning, everything. And now at this stage, as CDS has also confirmed that we are ready to present it to our uh, uh, decision makers that this is how we want to go about it. 
Now that requires what? It requires jointness and integration. So jointness 1.0, this is what we were looking at. Wherever the small structures or the kind of organizations can be joined together, for example, courses of instructions we have, we have the joint logistic nodes what we have. Then we went in for jointness 2.0. Jointness 2.0 talks about culture, thinking, symbology, all these things. So there also we have made a great progress. Now I'm sure by uh, jointness 3.0 would also be coming. In this approximately 200 fields which we identified that we, we can look at jointness. And nearly 30% of that we have already achieved that jointness, others we are working. And uh, initially hiccups were there, the space was slow, but now the pace is going to be very, very fast. Now the second question which you said as for the army is going to get uh, major share of it or not. As far as the population is concerned, I must say uh, the difference between the Air Force and uh, Army, if I can put that. Air Force USP is the technology and Army's USP is the human resource. Air Force strength is centralization and Army's strength is decentralization at every stage, command, core, division and all that. Army follows a system of complex adaptive system. Others may follow a system of complex linear system. So there is a difference of opinion. But what is important is army and land forces. What is bigger? Land forces because everybody in the TBA comes into play. Then what is bigger than the land forces is the multi-domain. When we talk about the cyber, EW, space, cognitive, all these things. Now who is going to control all that? Will it be one man or multiple? So if you have a senate sitting together and deciding on that, I think the time will be passed. So therefore you need one man to decide on that. Therefore theater commander is important. Can be from the Air Force, can be from the Army, can be from the Navy. The government is uh, also considering tweaks to the Agnipat scheme and there are some reports that they will increase the retention rate. Um, it may be a decision that is politically motivated, but whatever the reasons, and it is going to impact the force that you lead, what is your take on the recruitment debate? So, Palke, I'll start from you only, women empowerment. When we talk about it, when the women came into the army, we didn't know how to handle it. <laughs> it was difficult. We had some plans, but what came on the plateau was entirely different. Then we evolved over a period of time. Then we further built up on that. The courts also came in between. They also helped us to kind of uh, uh, converge on the correct path. Similarly, as for the Agni is concerned, as of today, approximately by December 24, we'll be having one lakh population which will be in the Indian Army. What is the ground feedback? The ground feedback is excellent. When I talk to the CEOs and commanders, they're very happy with it. Because these people are enthused, ready to learn. They have the urge to showcase also what they have learned. And there was some fear they will compete with each other. Even I had that kind of fear. But when I go on ground, I recently visited my unit in Yoma. And I realized, no, they're very happy. There is a great degree of cooperation among themselves. They're not competing with each other. So what it means that the youth profile which is required with our northern front rebalancing what we have done, the youth profile is definitely required. That is one. Second issue is that what are we doing about it? The aim is that the training which we were giving it for a longer period has to be given for a shorter period. And the youth which we are selecting is definitely better because what we are doing now, we are firstly carrying out a written examination and thereafter we are going for the physical. So as far as his mental and physical synergy or the harmonization is concerned is definitely better. When we talk about what will happen in future, it's an evolutionary process. For example, one thing we all agree that when we want ITI qualified personnel, then we need to increase the age. So that is already on the plateau what we are discussing. As far as the other issues are concerned, internal discussion keeps taking place. So when something comes on that, I'm sure I'll give you a call and inform you. We talked about uh, technological advancement. Um, AI is something that uh, a lot of countries are talking about. And recently, some 60 countries gathered in South Korea to sign an agreement on using AI in military. It's the future, we all understand. Uh, but we don't quite, I mean, it's still the Wild West. Uh, do you think that we have enough understanding and enough guardrails to deal with something like this? So whenever you are carrying out a, a 
evolution, if I can say that. You will be having the infirmities and kind of insecurities will be there. But it does not stop you from improving yourself. So to begin with technology, if you're talking about, we have 16 uh, technology clusters what we're having, where we have the principal staff officers responsible for it. That is point number one. Coming on to the artificial intelligence, what we understand that the data becomes very important. Artificial intelligence is the very mature stage which comes up very later. Firstly, we have to have a data. Then thereafter, we should be able to analyze it. Where we will be able to carry out predictive analysis. Then we go to the AI, where we are looking at machine learning or evolving AI or the generating AI, etc. what we are talking about. So what we have done, that we have some regional training notes. We have the MOUs with various IITs to work towards that. We have single source of truth in the complete Indian Army, which we are evolving with the information system, what we are having. So we have the data at various places. But in a gradual manner, slowly we will have to integrate that because while integrating that data, we should not let loose some information which is more than confidential. So that we are looking at. We are, as of now, working on the APIs or the gateways so that the various data can talk to each other. Once that happens, then we will move towards the AI. Now, in between, what is to be done? That the HR which is there, that is required to be trained in the AI that we are working out. Then we have opened our AI incubation cell. Uh, Deputy Chief uh, Asens is sitting here. He went to Bangalore recently and he signed uh, with Bell the AI incubation cell so that we work together and we have our younger generation, which is going to be the future, will get trained in it. And I'm sure within three, four years, what we are looking at, we should be able to combine the data and the AI together. Meanwhile, we are having a lot of things. For example, chatbot for the uh, veterans we are having. So those... Initial stages of AI, we have been able to achieve a lot. Now, how to plug the security gaps? That is something, a challenge which we are having. And we are working towards that. And uh, we are not fully prepared towards that. I can say that. You spoke about gray zone warfare as well. How do you think India is poised, given the fact that increasingly conflicts are being fought in, <clears throat> with non-military means? And we've seen that even in, in military <coughs> conflicts, we've seen uh, how Israel, for instance, penetrated the Hezbollah network. Uh, we've, we've heard concerns from uh, the leadership in the Indian Army, including General Rawat, who spoke about the two and a half front that India faces. Um, are we making progress to equip ourselves to fight that war? See, army was always, if I can say that if you take a surgeon, whole life is operating on a mannequin and thereafter only one time he gets to operate on a real patient. So that is how the army is preparing itself. Now is the time we all have decided that war will come when it comes. But the period which is in between, which is in grey zone, which does not, for example, do we call Doklam a war? We, do we call Kargil a full-fledged war? Do we call Galwan a war? The answer is no. So they all part form part of basically the grey zone battle. So we need to prepare for that. And uh, I keep saying for that, the two CO must converge as far as thought process is concerned. That means the commanding officer and the chief of army staff. So what it means that the complete level has to have a common thinking. Because a small tactical Misaction will lead to a strategic ramification where the whole of nation may get approached, uh, kind of uh, involved. So keeping that in view, we are preparing as ourselves for the grey zone battle. And here, the cyber, the EW, cognitive domain. What we talk about cognitive domain when we talk about the battle of narratives, it is not only for the adversary across. Our own population... When I include the veterans and related to families, we find that 1.3 crores is the population of the defense. That population also is required to be protected and the correct information must come out. That's what I say, battle of narratives. So in all the domains, we need to prepare ourselves. And the check has to be given that what is the degree of delegation which is required to, orchestra, to carry out actions within this gray zone. So there are various levels we are controlling that. You spoke about uh, uh, making India in defense and enabling private players and government players as well. There was recently a, a report that we saw India recently placed an order for 73,000 six-hour firearms, uh, the second order in five years, but some Indian weapons makers questioned it, and they said that why not make use Indian-made firearms? Uh, how do we balance then um, 
strategic needs with with uh, uh, with make in india in defense yeah, you're absolutely right very good question i must say that so now begin with i will take you back to american civil war the range between the two fighting forces used to be 75 meters because the weapon could fire only 75 meters so they used to sit behind a, a tree log fire and get back to refill now i'll take you back again mind to uh, back to 1988 when i as a youngster was showing to the army commander 5.56 in sars weapons what came up the rifle got approved the lmg got approved but i remember as a commanding officer even i couldn't let go of 7.62 mm lmg then the carbines no change and the carbine even today do we have a replacement now we'll go to 2013 14 2013 14 we tried a level best that the private player should be allowed to be given license for the small arms production what happened nothing so what has happened india over a period of time has been left behind in such kind of a technology which should have been kind of a developed much earlier i have been in the business of procurement from 2012 onwards what i have seen every year everybody has been saying look i can provide subject to so moment you had subject to that become difficult when i was the dg infantry i went to a, a kind of a farm in uh, bangalore and i said okay you made a beautiful sniper now you tell me what can you give it can is it made in india is it no sir actually rifling takes place at so and so place the barrel is imported from so and so place the ammunition is imported from so and so place so here we have the caliber but are we able to integrate had we been able to integrate the carbine should have been there with us today today we have the smc 9mm which we are still saddled with so what have we done about it now today six or the weapon which is there has got a 500 meter range it is one of the best weapons in the world and in 2019 during jal rawat's time this was approved and that time it was discussed that if it weapons proof good then only for the front line troops i am using the word only for the front line troops of the infantry and mech infantry this will be given because your weapon is not only for killing the other it is also for protecting you for that 500 meters which has to come the enemy has to move in because you don't have any protection you have only helmet on so you are protecting yourself by only firing therefore this is very very important and is also involved in the bayonet fighting so keeping that in view the 73000 were imported earlier now you cannot saddle a soldier ye below ye below ye below means five six types of weapons he can't handle so therefore it is pertinent to give him the weapon with which he feels most comfortable so we have given him the full amount now what is required by the front line soldier and the deficiency is being filled in by ak203 as you are aware in collaboration with the russians we are producing it in india and it will be great success now the other rifles other lmgs other carbines all will be coming from the make in india initiative yeah i think that that should be it for now but thank you very much uh, general duvedi for taking all the questions and speaking so openly about uh, issues that that can be uh, complicated thank you palki and thank you for uh, helping me out and uh, with your bright smile i could actually remain confident i am very thankful for that thank you thank you first post decodes the us election explains how america chooses its president you are primer on the race to the white house Everything you need to know about how America votes and its global implications. US election explained every Monday and Thursday only on First Post.